this one, I'm going to be building the best value 7600 gaming PC build I can put together. Coming in at anywhere between 850 and 900 US dollars, this is a build you do not want to mess with for top of the range 1080p gaming performance that doesn't break the bank. I'll be walking you guys through all the parts that make this build possible, how to assemble the system step by step, and looking at performance later to make sure this build tallies up compared to other part options out there on the market. Let's do this. The Corsair Xenion Flex provides the ultimate large form factor OLED gaming experience. With a massive 21 by 9 45 inch panel that bends from being fully flat to up to 800R, there is nothing else like it. The 3440 by 1440p resolution is sharp, while the 240Hz refresh rate makes this a great option for competitive gamers. Learn more about the Corsair Xenion Flex at the Corsair web store, linked down in the description below. Now let's begin by touching briefly on the Radeon 7600. It's been a week of controversial GPU launches in many ways. Nvidia's 4060 Ti seemingly failing before it had even loaded up any game newer than 2021, and the 7600, while suffering in some degree with the same VRAM issue, but doing so at a far lower price point and marking itself out as a very competitive 1080p GPU. Take a look at these performance graphs, you can see the 7600 sits just below the 4060 Ti in a number of titles, despite costing $130 less at just 269 USD. You get all the fancy next gen features too and we'll be looking at detailed performance numbers a bit later, but if you want to build a system around this card, what are the best parts to go for? Well in this build I wanted to go AMD. Let me talk you through the motherboard, CPU, RAM, all that jazz. Now at the heart of this build is the Ryzen 5 7600. Not the 7600X, the standard 7600. Side note, this build has got a Radeon 7600 and a Ryzen 7600. They are identically named products. AMD, what were you thinking? This is a great chip though. It's got a really low TDP of just 88 watts but it can perform basically with the same performance levels at just 65 watts. On board you get 6 cores and 12 threads, plenty for the latest titles, and also a boost clock speed of over 5 gigahertz. So that makes this thing a really compelling option for a price point that doesn't break the bank. And something that's helping the Ryzen 7000 cores even further is this, the release of new A620 motherboards. Now, we're still waiting for the wide range of boards to be properly released and on sale, but this was one I was able to get my hands on nice and quickly with next day shipping. So let's take a look. This is the ASRock A620 M Pro RS, and it's a very compelling A620 motherboard for a few reasons. First of all, you get four RAM DIMMs, not two which you'll find on cheaper alternatives for dual channel DDR5. We've got PCI Gen 4 for our M.2 SSD and Gen 4 for the graphics card and the inclusion of Wi-Fi. And you can see here where our two Wi-Fi antennas plug in at the back. It's a very simple affair, but the color scheme's nice, built-in IO, no support for overclocking of the processor, but that's not gonna be a problem for today's build as the Intel alternative, the 13400F isn't overclockable anyway, so this motherboard, totally fine. If you haven't seen how you go ahead and install the Ryzen 7000 chip, very easy. Pull up the arm on the retention socket, then lift our ASRock cover. AMD Ryzen is then going to be read basically upright with the triangle in the top left-hand corner of the socket. Little bit of a wiggle, but nothing too aggressive. Return the socket cover, add in the arm, and then start slowly apply a bit of pressure. The socket cover is going to pop off. Keep hold of this in case you ever need to RMA your motherboard, and then we're pretty much good. I'm also going to add into place the DRAM or memory at this stage. This is a 32 gig kit of Corsair Vengeance RGB in white. Now any DDR5 kit, frankly, the cheapest DDR5 kit you can get a hold of is what I'd recommend for this build, but I like this kit. It works well and it's pretty competitively priced. Pull back the clips on the second and fourth dim slots. You only have to release the top clips as the bottom are fixed, then drop the DRAM into place, thumb on each side of the dim, and it will click in nice and easy. In fact, that was a very good click. Repeat this for as many dims, lovely stuff, and you can see the color scheme starting to come together. M.2 is the next stage of the build. I've gone for another Corsair product, purely by coincidence, the MP600GS. Now, this is available in a one terabyte capacity for sub $60 on Newegg right now. I'll link everything today down below for latest pricing. That kind of price point for a Gen 4 NVMe is extraordinary. Of course, there are cheaper drives out there with 
lower speeds, but I'd recommend spending the extra few dollars on this Gen 4 drive, especially at this price point. Although this board is certainly very basic, you still do get some bells and whistles, including this little M.2 heat sink, heat spreader. This is gonna help to keep the MP600GS nice and cool, and also adds a bit of an aesthetic edge to the build. Now with that all pretty much good, there's only one part left to install onto the motherboard assembly, and that is the CPU cooler. Now, unlike with the Intel Core i5-13400F, where I recommended the stock cooler, I won't be doing that today. Instead, I'd recommend picking up this Deepcool AK400 in white. Now you can see here, this is not only a pretty stunning looking cooler, if you ask me, with this 120 mil fan and gorgeous sort of machined heatsink design, but it's affordable and will keep the CPU nice and cool. Spending 30 to $40 on an air cooler is gonna be a big upgrade. It keeps thermals lower, keeps audio noise levels down as well. Your stock cooler is gonna be a bit louder. In terms of getting it installed, it's actually pretty simple. We need to take these sort of orangey plastic stoppers and place them over the four holes now poking through the motherboard. Then secure this silver bracket in with the four silver screws. And that's then gonna provide the basis for the actual cooler to be installed. A drop of thermal paste, remove the cooler fan and screw the whole unit down. The cooler fan can stay off until after we've moved the motherboard into the case to keep things nice and open and make life that bit easier. With the cooler now finished, it's time to move over into the case. And this is the Montec Air 100 Lite. PC cases have got crazy expensive recently and I'm not here for it. This Montec Air 100 is about as good as it's gonna get. And as it says on the box, it is all white with good value. Yeah. Now, does everything we need. Mesh, tempered glass, decent build quality, micro ATX form factor. Isn't gonna support behemoth next-gen massive GPUs, but our humble 7600 will fit just fine. So let's open it up and take a look. And here we are. Look at that. I mean, it's simple, but you've got a little handle for the side panel, which removes on uh, hinges. And you can just pull it off, off the top, nice and simple. Obviously, no captive thumb screws or anything overly fancy, but the build quality feels pretty good. There's no complaints from me. And you've got four 120 mil fans, which is more than what, to be honest, you get in cases that cost double this from some of the main tier one brands, if you will. Inside one of the uh, hard drive cages in the rear of the case, which let's be honest, you're probably not going to use, you do get a bag of cable ties and screws. But most importantly, for the next stage of the system build, a couple of standoffs and a standoff installation tool too. Now, taking a look on the inside of the chassis and standoff wise, there's just just a couple that are missing. So one here and one here. I'll add those two in first by hand and then with the standoff tool before screwing the motherboard into place. The integrated IO shield makes life a lot easier on the motherboard install front. So good work, Azrock, on this undoubtedly very cheap budget motherboard. Now I've talked a bit about the 7600 earlier. I'll talk more about it in the performance section, but for not that much more than 250 US dollars, there's no denying that this has got to be one of the better value cards we've seen in ages. Now, in order to just check the clearance, it's pretty simple. Hover it over. Easy. You can even put like a radiator in the front of this case if you really wanted to. I do need to loosen up this bolt just here and move back the PCI cover and then determine which of these not particularly nice single use PCI covers need removing. So hover the graphics card over the slot and by the looks of things, yep, it is actually the first two. So snap it out, give it a bit of a wiggle. There you go, and you'll see one side now comes dislodged. Continue wiggling, careful not to scratch the motherboard. The other side becomes dislodged too. Maybe if you're building this system for yourself, might be worth removing these before the motherboard goes in, but just make sure that you know exactly which ones it is, as those are not going back in anytime soon. Push the clip back on the PCI slot, then go ahead and slide the GPU into place. Oh yes, bit of pressure. Add or click in, just a faint click, but you can give it a little bit of a tug from the central portion to make sure it's in okay. Couple of screws to secure it down, and then the PCI cover goes back on to hide the nasty gap. So far though, I'm really digging how this is looking. It's coming together very nicely. The final port of call then is to install the PSU. Now, if you take a look at AMD's official recommended wattage unit, it says 550, but read into the asterisk and the small print, and you'll see that that's with a Ryzen 9 5900X. The 7600X, non-X uses a lot less power. We won't be doing any CPU overclocking, making a budget PSU like this actually a viable option. Of course, if you want to add loads of extra accessories, loads of drives, a new graphics card, 
card in future, maybe upgrade the CPU, go for a higher wattage power supply. But this is gonna work perfectly for what I need today. And also it keeps the cost down. Something that we're trying to achieve with this uber budget, amazing value build. Remove all the front panel cables, grab the PSU itself, slide it in nice and simple and secure it down with four screws just at the rear here. The fan is gonna pull in fresh air from under the case, keeping the PSU nice and cool. I'm gonna wire up a few of the components. So the motherboard is first, that's the large connector on the right hand side of the board, followed by a single eight pin power cable on the GPU. None of this PCI Gen 5 nonsense and a dual four pin to the top left for the CPU. As I say, no overclocking, so very power light in terms of this build overall. Front panel cables come next, USB 3 to the right hand side, HD audio to the bottom left, and the front panel JFP ones to the bottom right. Take your time because these can be the most fiddly part of the build process. The only thing left to find out now is whether I've done a good job building this system or not and whether it will as such turn on before we look at those performance figures. So let me grab a monitor, keyboard and a mouse and I'll be right back. So here goes nothing, power button. It is booting, but I haven't plugged the fans in properly. So I'm gonna do that in a moment. First, let's just see, it says check cable connection. Cable connection's pretty good. Front three fans are now spinning, as is the rear, but still no sign of a boot just yet. So let's restart, see if we have better luck next time. Power button again, no video input. A few moments later. Oh, no way. I've left the GPU power cable unplugged when I went to add the front panel cables on. I've messed up massively. That should be the root cause of the problems. Turn the PC back on. Is it gonna boot this time around? I really hope so. VGA, boot. Yes, oh, it's booted, hallelujah. I'm in Windows already, look at that. All that's left to do now is look at performance, but first, how good this build looks in the only way we know how. That's right, it's time for a GeekWatt montage and I'll rejoin you in just a few seconds. <laughs> performance, the RX 7600 and this wider build in general certainly impress, especially for the 1080p gamer, but more on that later. Let's start by looking at Warzone 2 first of all. 1080p, high settings with DLSS and FSR set to the quality preset, and this build pulled in an impressive 134 frames per second on average. The 7600 provides results like this across the board in a range of titles. It's a similar story in the likes of Hogwarts Legacy, where at 1080p high, the build also pulls in 140 and four frames a second. It's a really, really playable frame rate at high settings at the 1080p resolution and impressive for a graphics card that costs just $269. Battlefield 2042 at 1080p high with DLSS set to performance pulls in a pretty strong 119 frames per second. While my next title, Overwatch 2 at 1080p Ultra, takes things up a notch on the frame rate front, skyrocketing the FPS to 223. Titles like Apex Legends also stack up well, 1080p p high and this title pulls in 190 fps bump up to 1440p and you will lose some frame rate down to 148 to be precise fortnite finally to wrap things up at 1080p competitive settings delivers a very strong 275 frames per second on average and this build really does deliver some phenomenal numbers for an overall build budget that doesn't break the bank the 8 gigabytes of vram on the 7600 is more than enough for 1080p at least in most titles but consider cards like the 67 50 XD as a better alternative for those looking to play 1440p titles in the foreseeable future. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. Links to everything will be down below. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.